It's the weekend and you have financial questions that need answering. That can only mean one thing. It's time for Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome to the Jill on Money Show. I know it's a big weekend, so you're out and about and you're rushing around. And if you are as excited about this time of year as I am, I know that there's too much to do. I get it. But I'm so happy that you are joining us today because we are re-airing an interview that I conducted with author Dan Pink. Now, four years ago, pre-COVID, he wrote a book called When?, The Scientific Secrets of Perfect Timing. And it's an excellent book for this time of year. And so we went through the archives. I thought this was a really good way for you to be rushing around and thinking about lots of different things that actually are meaningful in your life. And it explains so much of why this period of time, the end of the year, turning a page over for the beginning of the year, how it can really help you identify goals. And it also will give you a little bit of the science behind this idea of timing. So here is an interview that we conducted with Dan Pink in January of 2019, just as relevant today. I'm happy to bring it to you. Let's start by explaining sort of the the natural cycle of how we as human beings are programmed. So talk about that and how this might have uh, encouraged you to dive deeper into the topic. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I mean, the reason I dove deeper into it was in part for that for that reason. I was frustrated because I was making all these decisions in my own life and making them in a haphazard way. And while I'm a little bit messy, I'm, I'm pretty anal retentive about decision making. And so I like to make decisions based on evidence. It didn't exist. I looked around and realized there's this incredible body of science out there that gives us clues about how to make these decisions. And so one of the cornerstones of all of this is exactly as you say, there is this pattern of the day that happens inevitably. And, and to simplify it, it there, we, 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 each day we move through a peak, a trough, and a recovery. Peak trough recovery. Most of us, about 80% of us, move through in more or less that order. Peak early, trough in the middle, recovery later in the day. People who are night owls, who have a, what's called an evening chronotype, much more complicated, actually much more interesting people. I'm not one of them. Nor I. Um, but they tend to hit their peak much, 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 much later in the day. And what we know um, from this mountain of research is that our brain power doesn't stay the same throughout the day. It changes. And in each of those periods, our brain power is different. And so finding the right thing to do in each of those segments allows us to do more work and better work. When you started talking about sort of the the night owl versus the lark, yeah. there was also a third category. Sure. And, and can you talk a little bit about sure. that? Yeah. So, so this is something that's called a chronotype in a field called chronobiology. Uh, and it's Which one- is like you'd like to whip out chronobiology at your next cocktail party, right? Like, let yeah. me tell you about that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's really it's really simple. Chrono time, biology, study of life. It's basically scientists who study our 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 rhythms, essentially. Yep. And um, what 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 we know is that each of us has different types. So, so we we talk about morning people and evening people, but and that's not folklore. That's actually real science. And here's what we know: fifteen percent of us very strong morning people, larks. About 20% of us, very strong evening people, owls. About two-thirds of us, though, are in the middle, uh, what I call third birds. And third birds, I mean, to oversimplify, you can think of kind of owls and non-owls, really, in, in how these patterns go. Most of us go peak trough recovery, but about, you know, a fifth of the, of the population has a very, very different rhythms and very, very different internal schedules. The point of kind of understanding what kind of person you are is to make sure you are working around those normal cycles absolutely, and not putting yourself in a position where you are forced to do something at a time where you may not be, uh, you know, obviously at your optimal cognition and energy and all of that. A- absolutely right. And, and, and what's interesting about that is that there are different kinds of cognition that work differently in each of those periods. So let's take that peak. The key characteristic of the peak, which again, for most of us is earlier in the day, for owls in the evening is that we're high in in what psychologists call vigilance. Vigilance is just our ability to bat away distractions. And so that makes the peak the ideal time for doing um, heads-down, focused work, Uh, uh, analyzing data, uh, 
uh, uh, writing a report, those kinds of things that require that kind of intense in- intensity. Now, what's interesting is that the recovery period, which is which is later in the day for most of us, late in the afternoon, early in the evening, our mood is high, but our vigilance is not. And that makes it a good time for things that require some kind of mental looseness. So iterating new ideas, brainstorming, certain kinds of creative problem solving. And so you should be doing your more kind of looser, creative, iterative stuff in that, in that peak period. And, and, and what we know is that, is that time of day matters in human performance. If you, if you look at, let's take a typical workplace, all right? And we know something, let's talk, let's talk about the statistical concept of variance here for a moment, okay? Variance. So you've got a workplace and there are a thousand people there and you plot them from bad to good. Who's bad and who's good right. in, in terms of their performance? And how do you explain why some people are better at their jobs and some people are not? Some people are smarter than others. Some people are more conscientious than others. Some people work harder. Some people have more social advantage, whatever. But what this research tells us is 20% of the explanation of that variance in performance is time of day. And that's something we can do something about. I can't make myself smarter, right. but I can actually do the right work at the right time. And so when you look at that, let's just say someone's listening and they have got a team of 50 people, okay? And what is the way to take that knowledge and structure a date potentially differently. Yeah, so it's a great it's a great question. I think what's interesting about this is while we have general patterns, there is considerable individual variation. So a lot of the things that you see in like life hacking sites, everybody should get up at four thirty in the morning, is nonsense. It, it doesn't work that way. Mm. Um, and and so each individual collection of people is going to be a little bit different. But what I would do, let's say you got fifty people, I actually would want to know their chronotype. Uh, I would want to know who are the larks, who are the owls, and who are in between. And it would also depend on what I was doing. So let's say I had a, um, let's say I was running an accounting firm, okay? Unlikely, but let's say I was running an accounting firm. And I had 30 of my people were were larks, okay. right? Um, or 30, or larky at least. Um, with those folks right there, I would not put them in a staff meeting at 9 o'clock in the morning, 10 o'clock in the morning, 11 o'clock in the morning. I would not lard up their calendars with meetings during the morning because I know that that's when they're highest in vigilance and that's when they should be doing their heads down accounting work, you know, auditing a financial statement or or doing that kind of thing. So I would leave them alone for that. If I I wanted to come up with, say, uh, let's, hey, guys, let's uh, figure out a way to do, um, what's a, a new line of business that we could create? I would have that conversation generally later in the day. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, I would also see who my owls are, if I have any owls. And for the owls, what I would do is essentially leave them alone and let them tell me when they are at their best. And if that owl wants to do her audit at 9 o'clock in the evening and she's not in her chair at 9.30 in the morning, I'm good with that. Right, just get the work done. I want her to do the work when she does it. We'll get back to that 2019 interview with Dan Pink in just a moment. If you are seeking help identifying your goals, helping to maybe think about what should take priority in your financial life, just give us a holler. Go to JillOnMoney.com, click the Contact Us button, and we would be delighted to bring you on the program. While you're on the website, check out all the new content, including my new video series on YouTube, Jill on Money, powered by The Compound. The Jill on Money radio show will be right back. Back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger helps you take the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's the Jill on Money Show, and we are re-airing an interview that we conducted with Dan Pink back in 2019. In this segment, we talk about Dan's own habits, being a morning person versus being a night owl. So for me, I would sometimes come to my office, at, you know, 8.30 in the morning, and first thing I would do is answer my email, okay? So it takes me an hour to, you know, clear out my email, and I have this delusion that, oh, I've cleared the decks. My right. sp- head is free, okay? Right. So it's 9.30, and it's like, oh, wow, I'm kind of hungry now. Like, maybe like, I'll go get a bagel, all right? Then I come back, and then, you know, 
four sports highlight reels later, it's lunchtime, and I haven't done my most important. I haven't done my most important work. You're writing. My writing, okay. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, as a well, you know this as mm-hmm. a Jill, as a writer, anytime you sit down to write. At that moment, the universe begins conspiring for ways to distract you. Oh, yeah. And so you want to do it at your, at your highest vigilance. So I actually have changed my way. So when I, on writing days, mm. I go into my office, still at 8.30, because I'm not an insane, you know, start working at 6 o'clock in the morning, Lark. What, what, you know what I do? What? I don't answer on my email. I don't mm. even open my email. Mm. I don't even bring my phone with me into the office. I give myself a quota of words and say, during this period of peak vigilance, Dan, you have to crank out these number of words. Wow, that's fascinating. And I then did you do it the next day and the next day and I'm, the next day and the next day. I'm really interested in this because I think that there are so many of us who are juggling lots of different tasks that we have to do throughout a day. And so what you're saying is work to your strengths. Do this task in the morning. And this is so weird because, like, you're saying this, and this actually happened to me yesterday. So I have to wake up and check email just to make sure I don't have to be on the air, right? So, which is annoying, but okay. Sure. But I I put it aside, I shut down my email, and I cranked out like three scripts and two columns. And two hours later, I was like, oh my God, I'm done. And I took the dogs out for a walk after. It was like beyond fabulous. That's how that's how you do it. And and the thing about email, I mean, like let's go back to my accounting firm here. I, what I might want to do is tell my accountant, my Larky accountants, you know what? Check your email. Make sure an important client hasn't contacted that's you. That's right. You know, so, some kind of just like basic maintenance and things like that. But you want to do your heads down focused work in your peak. You want to do your iterative work during your recovery. And then this trough period. Yeah, let's talk about that. Oh, what do we do then? It's a terrible time of day. I hate it. Well, I, I am the ultra lark because I wake up between four and five. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. But sometimes I have to be on the air. So it's okay, different, right? right? right so, right. But, but like, I, I, you know, so I generally wake up between four and five. And I looked at like I looked at your little schedule yeah. there, your graph, and I sort of okay, I know where I am. Yeah, so you're pretty larky. I'm very larky uh-huh. anyway, and it's a long day. So yeah. what do I do in the trough? When, when yeah. I'm kind of like I can even feel it, like in I physically feel that trough. Uh, we all do. Most of us don't acknowledge that though, and most of us say, oh well, uh, you know, it's some of us are like, oh, it should, it doesn't matter, or oh. It's a, a sign of moral weakness. Yeah, let me power through right. it. I'm oh. like, no, nah, I'm done with that. I okay. don't want to power through anything. Powering through is a really bad idea. Mm. All right? We tend to think, and, and, and unfortunately, somehow, especially in our business culture, we've been conditioned to believe that that's how you get more work done, that's how you get better work done, that powering through is also morally virtuous. Mm. And it's nonsense. So what you should be doing during that, that, um, that, that trough period, one, your, your work that doesn't require as much brain power and creativity, answering your email, uh-huh. filling out your expense reports, mm-hmm. doing that kind of mundane stuff that you have to do. The other thing that you should be doing, especially in the trough, is taking more breaks. There's a whole science of breaks that's been emerging, and what it tells us is exactly that powering through is a bad idea. Taking breaks is a good idea. We should be taking more breaks, and we should be taking certain kinds of breaks. And what are those types of breaks? Well, the the best breaks, and there's some interesting research on this, the best breaks are social rather than solo, which surprised me uh, as an introvert. So this is true even for introverts. Uh, the best breaks are, are moving rather than being stationary. The best breaks are outside rather than, than inside. And this is important. The best breaks are fully detached rather than semi-detached. So a break isn't having intense conversations about what's going on in the office. It's actually being detached. This gives us a fairly simple recipe. So I'm convinced that if everybody in America took each afternoon, scheduled a 10 or 15-minute walk outside with someone they liked, talking about something other than work, leaving their phone behind, you would have, I actually think you would have a measurable boost in productivity, and I think you would have a measurable boost in job satisfaction and engagement. Can you talk a little bit about how the personality traits, because the the ocean, the openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism, which I feel like I have all of those maybe at at different points in the day. Um, (laughs) So you said that, I'm just going to quote from the book, much of the research shows morning people to be pleasant, productive folks, introverted, conscientious, agreeable, persistent, and emotionally stable. Yeah. Now, I found that fascinating yeah. as someone who works in the mornings. Yeah, well, or someone who's a lark. Um, yeah. Yeah, th- there, are, there are personality differences. And 
let's let's take the other side of it. So let's talk about owls. Owls are more prone to depression. Owls are more prone to um, uh, other kinds of mental illness. Owls are more prone to addiction. But owls also test higher on both analytic intelligence and creativity. Mm -hmm. And so I think the interesting question there is which way the arrow points. Is it that people who have mental illness have a difficult time getting up in the morning and going to sleep at night? Or does going to sleep late and waking up late increase your chances of having some kind of problem. We don't know that, but there are these personality differences. I think that the, the implications for workplaces, though, back to my accounting firm, is that if I say that the main criterion at Pink Partners Accounting is that people have their butts in their seat at 830 in the morning, I am losing one-fifth of the talent pool, including the fifth of the talent pool that tests higher on analytic and creative intelligence. Mm. That's a mistake. So what about these places where they want there to be a physical presence of people in the office yeah. and they're trying to balance the needs of people to sort of have their own schedules, but there's a team? Yeah. So what's the conclusion for that? That makes, I mean, that makes perfect sense. I mean, I don't think that the ideal is necessarily that, that although there are workplaces like this, uh, there's, there's something, uh, a trend that's been out there for a while called a results-only work environment where people don't have any schedules. They come in whenever they want. And, and that, can, that can work in some instances. You know, I, I just think what you have to do is you have to give people the discretion to make those decisions for themselves. And the truth is, is that people want to be good teammates. People care deeply what their peers think of them. And so if there's a meeting or a group project, you'll come in. Right. Because in general, most people are responsible and people ha there's a certain amount of peer pressure that comes from not letting down your teammates. And to me, it doesn't that's not the problem. To me, that's not the biggest problem that we should be worrying about. If you have someone who says, I'm not coming in because I don't want to help my team. That's not a chronotype problem. That's a hiring problem. Yeah, that, that's a personality yeah, problem. Yeah. Right. Uh, let's shift gears and talk about lunch. Can you talk a little bit about fueling, refueling? gym time, all those like okay. fun parts of the, the chronotype. Right. But on lunch, we can think of lunch as, let's think of this big category of breaks. And lunch is just another category of break. And what the research tells us is that um, at some level, we have overvalued breakfast and undervalued lunch. Okay, I'll put it, I'll put it, in, I'll put it in, in, in investing terms, all right? I'm going to short my shares in breakfast and I'm going long on my shares I like of that. lunch. It's like All a right? day part kind of uh, spread that it, we're putting it, on. It's absolutely, because I, I do think that, the, that, that if you look at the actual research on breakfast, mm. it is. it doesn't say breakfast is bad, not at all. It says breakfast might be good. Yeah, and it's not as good as you think it is, probably. Yeah, and and it and it basically says, hey, healthy people eat breakfast, but we don't know whether eating breakfast makes them healthy. It mm. could be that healthy people just like to eat breakfast. Um, and also, some of these studies have been funded by breakfast food companies. And so you got to take it with some degree of skepticism. My view, I'm, I'm, I'm very agnostic on that. Eat breakfast if you want. Don't eat breakfast if you don't want. But lunch, because it's, it's in the middle of that work day, is valuable because it is a break. And it actually gives you some of the things that we know effective breaks give you. Particular, first of all, physical refueling. But second of all, if you have lunch with somebody else, another social, social interaction. interaction exactly. That's amazing. Jill on Money, we'll be right back. K's, IRAs, refinancing, she covers it all. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. You're back. It's Jill on Money. Here's more of my interview with Dan Pink. What about gym time? Like you talk about yeah. like taking walks, but is there an optimal time given peak trough recovery that we should be thinking about going? Should you be like if if peak is where you're really good at those mental Yeah tasks, like real thought process, should you not be working? Like a lot of people I know, they just like, I work out first thing in the morning because that's the best time to work out. Sure. Um, well, it could be for some people. And, and here's the thing. There, there, are, there are a number of different variables here, but what we, there's some good research on this. So what we know is that morning exercise 
is good for if you have certain kinds of goals. Morning exercise seems to be better for habit formation, mm. in, in part because you're less likely to get interrupted at 7 in the morning than at 5 in the afternoon. Morning exercise seems to be better for weight loss, although there's a lot of the research is showing that exercise is less, in, less effective for weight loss. Weight loss is really hard. Yeah, it's diet. It's, Sorry, guys. It, it's 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 <laughs> diet. Shut, you got to shut it's your also, mouth. It, but it's also it's also just that it's also like we're not prisoners of a bi- biology, but we live in a state governed by biology, mm-hmm. and so people have a set point of weight, cer- fairly narrow band, and they're unlikely to get too far on either side of it, and that's how you are. Th- blame your DNA. Um, but the one thing about morning exercise, which I think is is Very effective, though, is this, that exercise, aerobic exercise, certainly, some interesting new research showing even strength training gives us a a, a mood boost and and a pretty enduring mood boost, Mm. 10 hours sometimes. And so if you exercise in the morning, you get that mood boost all the way through the day. If you exercise at, say, 6 at night or something like that, you might end up sleeping through some of that mood boost. Now, late afternoon and early evening exercise is better for other things. It's better for avoiding injury. Um, Mm. And I think, this is my guess. Uh, I think that's because of changes in body temperature. Our body temperature is highest at that moment, so we're literally more warmed up. Hmm. Um, It's better for performance. Uh, Lung capacity is higher. Uh, Hand-eye coordination is better. Speed is greater. Hmm. And so there's some interesting research showing that uh, a disproportionate number of world records and speed events were set between 4 p.m. and 7 p.m. local time. That's wild. It's crazy, right? Yeah, it's great. Um, and then, um, and then also, people report enjoying late afternoon and early evening exercise more. That's so, just because that the hottest people are in the, in the gym at that time. Maybe? Could, be, could be literally the warmest because everybody's body temperature is, is the highest. It could be that you're throwing off the stresses of the day. I, I actually believe, and and, it, and it's weird. It's it's a weird thing. Like I never thought about is these changes in body temperature are actually more important than we realize. It Changes in body temperature are one of the things that a- add, that aid significantly in falling asleep and in wakefulness, and even in certain kinds of physical performance, that period when your body temperature is higher does boost you just a little bit. It really depends on your goals. One is not better than the other. And so for me, since I'm a lark, I actually don't like exercising in the morning because I like doing my work then. Yeah. And then by the end of the day, I'm so stressed out and miserable, I actually enjoy going for a run at five in the afternoon or mm-hmm. six in the afternoon or something That's like interesting. That. I, I am the midday kind of person. Okay. And I think that it has something to do with needing a boost, you know, because I wake up so early. If I finish this interview right now, which, you know, we'll wrap up and uh, I eat a little something and in an hour and a half, I'll go to the gym. Hmm. That, so about what time of day? Uh, two. Two in the afternoon. And that's about how far? So you woke up at what, five? Five. 4.30 this morning. Oh, my. Okay. So, like, one thirty or 2 o'clock. Okay. So, 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 4 to... So, that's nine hours after you've, after you've woken up. Yeah. So, so, for me, that would be something like... It's interesting. So, for me, it'd be something like... I wake up at around 7. If I went to the gym nine hours after I woke up, that would be 4 in the afternoon. Right. So... Pretty good. Yeah. You know, and it's funny because it, sometimes it's just, as you said, it has to be where you can form the habit. Sure, so for, sure. So I think that for many people, it's like, when are you going to actually get there? To me, it's like, oh, it's this perfect time. Morning's done. Sure. I mean, if the market blows up or does something weird in the middle of the day, I usually cancel. But whatever. Right. I think that just being aware of your own body is fascinating to me. And that's why I love this book, because so much of it felt like, yes, I could bring that into my life and make a positive change. So let us talk about my favorite word in the entire book, (laughs) nappuccino. By far the best. Are you a napper? I can be because I wake up so early. Right. And so there are, you know, it can sort of happen in the mid afternoon. I, I've sort of been thinking like, oh, I should be meditating. And actually napping feels better. <laughs> uh, you know what? But but I, it's interesting you say that because there are a lot of similarities um, in brain function and just in mood between napping and meditation. There really are. Um, here's what we know about napping. It's pretty good for us. Um, again, it goes against our puritanical ways. Uh, but the best naps are extremely short, between 10 and 20 minutes long. After that was what amazed me. That surprised me, too, because I began this pretty anti-nap because my own experience napping was unpleasant because I would wake up and I would feel like crap. And the and that's what something called sleep inertia, which happens when you nap beyond about 20 minutes. But a 10 to 20 minute nap is 
there's a lot of research on this. It's very restorative. Um, it's it's right in that it's right in that sweet spot. Less than ten minutes doesn't do you much good. More than twenty gives you sleep inertia. Right in that ten to twenty minute window, it really just smooths things over and restores a lot of mental acuity, restores some physical energy. Okay, so now add in the caffeine part. Okay, so here's so this is something I swear by now. I don't do it every day at all. But um, look at you! You're like, don't judge me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't do it every day. No, I don't do it every day. <laughs> I, I, you know, I want to advocate this, but I'm not. I don't want to be like a, you know, like a, you're like not a an pusher, a pusher on the corner, like handing out the drugs here. The here's what I do. So I have noise canceling headphones, and so I will set my timer for 25 minutes. Put on my noise canceling headphones. Right before I press go on my 25 minute timer, I will have a cup of coffee, and I just guzzle it. In fact, I will often brew a cup of coffee, put like some chunks of ice in it just to cool it off because I'm not enjoying the coffee. Mm. I'm just guzzling it. All right. Seems weird, but stick with me. So then I close my eyes, have my noise canceling headphones on, and I can usually fall asleep in, say, 10 minutes. And one of the things that we know about napping is that the more you do it, the better you get at it. And that, in that sense, it's very much like meditation. If you just take somebody off the street and say, start meditating, mm. they're going to have a really hard time. But you bring them back day after day after day after day after day after day after day, at a certain point, they're going to be able to meditate from 10 seconds to 30 seconds to a minute to a minute and a half. So napping is that way. So I can usually fall asleep in 10 minutes. I fall asleep in 10 minutes. My alarm goes off in 25 minutes. That gives me 15 minutes of actual nap. Right in that sweet spot. But here's the cool thing. Caffeine takes about 25 minutes to get into our bloodstream. So at that moment that I'm waking up, okay, ideal nap, no sleep inertia, I get this other boom, this boost of caffeine right there. And that's why it's called a nappuccino. The Jill on Money Show will be right back. Do I invest here? Should I put my money there? Jill Schlesinger can help you. Back to Jill on Money. You're back. It's Jill on Money. We are re-airing a 2019 interview with Dan Pink. And in this segment, we are discussing the importance of dates and goals. Why is the turn of a calendar? Why is Rosh Hashanah for Jews important? Why are these days, why are they become important in in terms of the timing of when you set goals? Yeah, it, they, um, they're, they're enormously important for a whole set of reasons because part of the science of timing is not only these daily patterns, but how do beginnings of any kind affect us? That's what we're talking about here. How do midpoints affect us? How do endings affect us? And there's some really, really beautiful, interesting research on what social psychologists call temporal landmarks. That's what you're talking about, temporal landmarks. And there's certain dates that stand out in time the way that physical landmarks stand out in space. So if I were directing somebody to my house in Washington, D.C., there's certain landmarks that I would tell them to look for to find my street. I'd have a, a smallish street. It's not one of the, but it's off of a really big street. And it's, anyway, it's, it's complicated because Washington has certain streets that are on diagonals and certain streets that are parallel. And I'm on a diagonal and it's small and blah, blah, blah. So my view is like, look for Cactus Cantina Restaurant. There you go. All right. Get and, a margarita and come over. So they see Cactus Cantina Restaurant. And they, what do they do? They start slowing down, right. becoming more aware. And that's what happens with these temporal landmarks. But they also do something else. They trigger this very peculiar form of mental accounting. So uh, what we do on certain of these dates is that we essentially open up a fresh ledger on ourselves. So think about ledgers in the old days when they're made of paper. They're not spreadsheets. They're not uh, Young or people like that. listening, go Google ledger yeah, so you yeah. can see what we're talking they're about. They're actually kind of beautiful. Ledgers I know. I love beautiful them. beautiful in a way. I know. And, and so, so what you're doing is you're opening up a fresh ledger on yourself uh, the way that a, bu- a small business 80 years ago would open up a fresh ledger on a new quarter or a new year. And you basically say, old me had a drink every day. New me reborn on the first day of January is going to be dry for the next 30 days. And so I think one of the interesting things about New Year's resolutions is that when you look at the numbers on New Year's resolutions, let's say the the numbers are all over the place. But let's say that by February... Um, two-thirds of people are not keeping their New Year's resolutions. Mm-hmm. Let's just stipulate that that's the right thing. Okay. To me, it's like that's 
bearing the lead. To me, that says, wait a second, one third of people are keeping their resolutions? That's pretty amazing when you think about how hard it is to change our behavior. Right. And so what this means, and this is some great research on what's called the fresh start effect done by uh, three researchers uh, at Penn, Katie Milkman, Heng Chen Dai, and uh, Jason Reese. And what they found is that certain dates are fresh start dates. So we're more likely to start behavior change and therefore more likely to have a fighting chance of continuing it. So you're better off starting, uh, let's say, I'm finally going to go to the gym regularly. Start that on a Monday rather than on a Thursday. Start it on the first of the month rather than the 23rd of the month. Start it on the day after your birthday rather than four days before your birthday. And you say there are 86 chances to have fresh starts? There are all kinds of fresh starts. The first day, every Monday is in some ways a fresh start. Every first of the month is a fresh start. There are both um, personal and social uh, fresh start dates. So, so for so personal one would be like you know the day after my wedding anniversary, right? Mm-hmm. So that would be July third. Not a meaningful date for most people, but a meaningful date for me. Um, the day after your birthday, the day after your kid was born, but also things that we share or things at small groups. So, so the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, that's a fresh start date. And actually, if you look at uh, what, what's interesting is that is that the way that certain religious traditions welcome in the New Year, it has all of the trappings of fresh start. Right? We announce it. We have we you know there's there's some talk sort of at least tangentially about a clean slate and starting over. The first of the month, there's the first day after. The first day after spring for students, the first day of a semester. Um, so whatever. So there's certain in our religious traditions, there's there are fresh start dates in our schools, there are fresh start dates in our personal lives and just on our regular cal- shared calendar. All right. Now, let me just show you something I marked up in your book. Yes. Do you see that? Do you see that midlife thing? Yes. Do you see where I what I circled there? Do you see what my age is? I'm right smack in the bottom. Fifty three age 53, well-being slumps in midlife. Uh, wah, wah. I am 54, so I so feel you, your pain. We are there. Um, what is up with this? This is some really, really interesting research uh, based on two dimensions. First, we talk about this idea of a midlife crisis. That's complete bunk. There is no evidence of a midlife crisis. It's one of, it drives me nuts that people actually even use that term because there's zero evidence of that. But something else I think more interesting happens in midlife and is, is basically what, they, what researchers call a U-shaped curve of well-being. It's not a crisis. It doesn't, the bottom doesn't fall out, but there's a dip, and the dip is around, in general, around our age. And the chart you're pointing to is a chart from uh, Angus Deaton, who's a Nobel Prize-winning economist at Princeton. But the, the, the U-shaped curve of well-being that, that he and his team found is similar to what researchers around the world have found. This is not an American phenomenon. This is a international phenomenon. This U-shaped curve of well-being in midlife, that is, we're happier in our 20s and 30s, we'd be into dip in our 40s, really you know, hit the, 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 the bottom of that gentle U in our 50s, and then generally start going back up, has been found in something like 70 countries. Hmm. If I were to show you that chart, and then say, if I were to show you that chart and not identify it, and then show you the chart of well-being over the lifespan in France, and then say, here's the well-being over the lifespan in uh, United Arab Emirates, you would not be able to tell the difference hmm. among those. Interesting. We'll get back to our interview with Dan Pink in just a minute. This is the Jill on Money Show. back. It's Jill on Money. Let's finish the interview with Dan Pink. As we get older, there is a great deal of evidence that we tend to be happier. But then I was th- reading your book and thinking yeah. about all that other strain of research, which is older people are isolated and lonely and that. So bring that together for me. Well, I mean, I actually think that that the preponderance of evidence is that old age Older age is a much happier time than we realize uh, for, for a couple of reasons. Uh, and there's some great work done on this by Laura Carsonson at Stanford. Uh, and she looked at uh, friendship networks. 
And what we typically see in the size of people, forget not not, not like Facebook, but like real friends. Yeah. Right? So if you look at the size of friendship networks, um, they they grow in the twenties, thirties, they grow, forties, fifties, they grow, but around age sixty, they start to drop. And sometimes significantly. And she was puzzled by that because that is superficially the story of isolation and despair and loneliness. And what she instead did is she, she unpacked that and she had the people, uh, as she examined their friendship network, she said, okay, divide people into groups. Inner circle, middle circle, outer circle. Inner circle, people you can't live without. Next circle out, people you really like. Next circle out, yeah, they're cool too. And what she found is that all of the decline was in the middle and outer circles. Hmm. That, and, and then in, in some instances, that inner circle actually grew a little bit because at the end, you know, toward the end, if you're like, say, in, you know, I'm in the final third of this book here, um, I got to get rid of some of these characters because they're boring me. They're not doing anything for me. And you're more, you're more willing to shed their, you're more willing to shed those friends because you're focused on these things. And, and, and what we know is that intimate, Social connections is one of the things that makes us most satisfied. There's a, you know, there's a famous grant study uh, from Harvard where they, they had, the, it's all men, it's all white men, where they, they followed these men for decades and decades and decades from the time they were undergraduates. They did another one of some working yeah. class people in Boston. And as you follow them through, it basically, like, who's happy and who's not? And Robert Waldinger, the, the Harvard guy who's running this program now, says, you know, it's basically... Happiness is love, full stop. That's it. You have people who you, you you have people who you care about, you have people who care about you. Boom. That's it. That's it. It ain't money. Oh, it's not money. It's not even uh, money is good, all right? And professional accomplishment is good, and making a contribution to the world is good, but at the center of it all is do you have people you love and do you have people who love you? Jill on money. We'll be right back. It's the weekend, and that can only mean one thing. You're listening to Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. You're back. It's Jill on Money. We are answering your financial questions. Let's talk to Elaine, who's on the line from the Midwest. Hello, Elaine. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me on the show, Jill. Uh, We are so happy that you're here. So tell us, what can we do for you? What's on your mind today? So um, my husband and I are looking at retirement, and I just wanted to kind of run our situation by you and see if you, you know, at high level think we're on track, or if not, if you have some suggestions for us. Okay. Um, let's start with an easy one. How old are you? Okay, I'm 59 and my husband is 64. Okay. And are you guys both working still? I semi-retired two years ago. So I work part-time and he still works full-time and plans to do that until uh, mid-2024. He plans to do that until I tell him he's allowed to stop. <laughs> <laughs> How much does he earn full-time? Uh, he makes 130 a year. And what about your part time? My part time, I make twenty seven a year. So you said he's going to do this, so he'll retire at the end, like a year from now, the end of twenty four. Um, the summer of twenty twenty four. Oh, because we want to have a summer. Thank you very much. <laughs> Retirement. I'm just writing that down. Summer twenty four. Okay. Are you entitled to a pension? Yes, um, I have a pension that's thirteen thousand a year. That's not included in the part-time income, right? No, no. Okay, so 13000 a year, got it. And um, that doesn't have a COLA, but it is transferable to him if I were to pass. Okay. And then I have a second pension of 23000 a year, and it does have a COLA, but it's not transferable to him if I were to pass. You're collecting right now, or they start? you start the clock in the future? No, I'm collecting now. Okay, you're loving that. Yes. <laughs> yes, thank you. Okay. Tell us about him. Does he have a pension benefit that he'll be entitled to? No. That's the wrong answer. I I'm done. I mean, forget <laughs> it. Um, have you saved up piles and piles of money to make this dream a reality? I mean, we've saved up some. We've been together 16 years. And when we got together, that's when we really started, you know, saving a lot. Um, so I have 365000 in a traditional 401k 
he has 265,000 in the traditional 401k. Mm -hmm. Um, Then we have 40,000 in an HSA and we have 110 in cash. And then our house is worth about 500,000 and it will be paid off this spring. If you look at your expenses right now, what do those look like? You know, if you, um, you know, don't be crazy, but like, really, what, how much you want to live on? So in retirement, we'd like to live on about 7,500 after taxes. What's his social security benefit? Here's the question I have. So the strategy is my social security benefit at 62 is around Mm 20,000. And we would like to be able to let his ride until he's 70 Mm -hmm. and it would be 50,000. Are you thinking that you go to half of his at his age 70? Is that how you were thinking about it? No. Or you're saying you're going to just take yours at 62 and that's that? Correct. Well, why do we, you don't have to do that. Can we wait? What's your benefit when, if you wait to your full retirement age? Um, It's 35,000. That seems a lot better to me. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't know how to fill the gap between. Well, let's think about that. So we, it's okay. So let's pretend that that's what you do. So that's at 67, right? Is your full retirement age. So oh, my full retirement. Sorry. Sorry. My, no, my full is 28. I'm sorry. 28,000 and yeah. 35 was 70. Correct. Okay. Let me do that. 28,000. Okay. And I, and I wanted to say, I, I'll probably work part-time until I'm 65. Okay. Thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> and I do get, I will get health insurance from that. And okay. The- that's great. That's good. Okay. So for income wise, we have, we have 36 from the pension, right? We have 27 from part-time. Right. And then 20 from Social Security. Right. We're at 83. 83 is pre-tax. You want 90 net. So we have to pull out. We still have to pull out 25, 30 grand mark. We have to basically drain the 265 grand account about because we have to pay tax on that. Right. For five years. Okay, I guess that's doable. I'm looking at this. I guess it's doable. It's one of the rare instances where I see why you want to do this, the pulling out, claiming early at 62. See why I called you? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, the thing is, I think you probably can do it, but I'm not sure you're going to be able to do it forever. To semi-retire at 57 is a very, very early retirement, right? I can tell you how it works better. You're going to hate me. Really, you're not, but your husband is. Like, it'll work better if he could work for a couple more years. Does he hate that idea or do you hate that idea? He doesn't mind part-time for for some more years. Okay, wait, could he tell me, is that something that's possible? Yes. If he's willing, okay, here's what I think. If he's willing to work part-time to fund your difference, then I think you're golden. I would rather you not be pulling out too much money. You just don't have that much money in these retirement accounts. And I really do think that if you live until you're 90 years old or whatever, you know, like it's really about how old you are. And you know what I'm worried about when you said to me $7,500 a month after taxes, I don't know. I'm worried that that's going to turn into $9,000 a month after taxes because that's what happens when people do, you know what I mean? I do. Yeah. So I I, I want to, I just want to caution you. It's not a slam dunk. You've convinced me that drawing at 62 can work in your case. Everybody else listening, do not do not necessarily take this as your advice, okay? But I see how that could work. But there's some danger in this. Um, you know, in years where you see like the markets go down, that's why I don't want to, de- I don't want to depend on the 401ks because, you know, in down years and you're pulling money out, it can be pretty daunting for you to be like, okay, we're 78 you know, and, uh, you know, he's 78 and I'm in my early 70s. And like all of a sudden the money in the 401k is, is really down. And I'm just concerned that that's going to be an uncomfortable position for you guys to be in. What about using some of the 110000 cash to fund some of the different? You could, but I love that cash. And, you know, you're not going to have income for a bit. So, you know, I like you having two years of like, the difference in the bank, right? So I like that. You can use some of it and maybe it's like he retires. Okay. Let's say he retires this year. So essentially we get half a year of income from him. And then the second half of the year, you're like, okay, we're going to travel. We have some money in cash. That's great. He gets back 
And maybe we make a pinky swear that in 2025, he starts working again, doing some part-time work. And then I think it works better. I really do. And it's good for him. Yes, I think it, I think it will be too. And I, I think, I think that's kind of what we were leaning towards, but we just really needed to kind of run it up against somebody else. And yeah. Yeah. See if we were doing it correctly. I, I absolutely, I'm so happy you did that because look at we're we're walking through it and I'm like, no, yes, no, yes. And like, you know, like it, it's hard sometimes you're, you're kind of on the bubble, but I think yes. it's going to be okay. I do. And as long as you guys are a little flexible on this, it will work okay. If you would like to join us on the air, all you need to do is go to JillOnMoney.com and click the Contact Us button. All of our content lives there. We'll be right back. Back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger helps you take the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's Jill on Money, the program that tries to take the mystery out of your financial life. If you've got a financial question, just go to JillOnMoney.com and click the Contact Us button. Let's get to an email from Joel, who writes about his elder care. And he said, I am a 42-year-old single dad. I don't want to rely on my daughter as my elder care option. How do I financially plan for my own elder care so I know I'm taken care of and I don't disrupt my daughter's livelihood? At this time, I don't know if I would want in-home care or retirement home. I'd like to plan for both. You know, first of all, you're a little young to be thinking about this, 42 years old. And this is the reason you have children. So they take care of you. That's my understanding as someone who has no children. I look, I, I'm joking, but it's it's good to think about it. But a lot of this does depend on how much money you have and how much you're going to accumulate and what the sources of income will be during your retirement. You know, the easiest answer to this is simply that we would encourage you to start looking at long-term care options. But, you know, as a single person, um, you know, I don't know if you're going to want to spend the money doing that rather than saving for retirement. So I will encourage you to check out some long-term care options, but really get back in touch with us. I'd love to know a little bit more about you, Joel, so that we can help you make better choices. I do think it's a bit premature to be thinking about this. Okay. Okay. Next, let's take a note. This is from Luna. Subject, Jill's conservative outlook on the 4% Trinity study. Okay. Can Jill explain more fully why she is even more conservative than the 4% rule for withdrawals, which came out of a detailed study saying it is, in fact, a safe percentage based on market history? I understand that you need a cash bucket in case the market is down some years. I don't understand why Jill thinks this is too risky. No one needs to die wealthy. I use new retirement to project my withdrawals in retirement, which is the best way to actually budget cash flow. I'd love to hear why the rule of thumb is consistently viewed with skepticism by Jill. Well, because the 4% rule was developed when financial markets were producing very high returns and they looked backwards at different times and I'm not comfortable with it. If you're comfortable with it, that's fine with me. That's great. But in my experience in the real world of watching people and how they manage their financial lives, when the market is down, they usually don't have enough cash and they do freak out and they do bail out. And essentially, I I am not convinced that the 4% number is actually the right number for every single person. You want to use it as a guideline? Go crazy. But I think that in the real evidence on the ground, when I talk to actual financial planners, is 4% is too much. I don't know. A lot of people say that, you know, the 4% rule, it's it's great if you do this. And that. But, you know, I just, I'm telling you that on the ground, when you look at this, so many people that I know who manage money for a living 
manage people who are actually, you know, have real on the ground experience, right? That this is actually a problem, that the 4% rule is one where people will live and they say, oh, of course. And I understand that when on a year when the markets are down, I'm going to have to spend some of my money, but they, they get freaked out now. Okay. Well, let's, let's be clear that, you know, I know that this is an entrenched piece of, of research. And I know that we are also in a period of time that's a little bit different, but heck, I will tell you this. You say nobody needs to die wealthy. I would say nobody needs to be panicky at age 82 because the rule's not working as well as they thought. That's how I feel about it. I, I don't know. Again, I'm more conservative. You want to do it, you do it. Okay. Here we go. This is from Karen who says, hi, Jill and Mark. I want to say I so enjoy your podcast. I've learned so much from them. Thank you. My husband and I retired two years ago. He's 62 and I'm 60. We still work part-time and are mostly able to cover our expenses between his pension and our income. Nice. I have an IRA that I manage on my own and I have been able to achieve about 7% growth over this last year. That's awesome. My husband has a financial planner that's only been able to grow his account <laughs> less than 2% over the same period after he takes his 1% fee. My IRA is with Vanguard. I think I'm ready to manage his as well. I'm not sure what his diversification should be. I was in the Life Strategy Moderate Growth Fund. I changed to a target retirement income six months ago with my IRA. What are your thoughts on investing his IRA into one mutual fund or exchange traded fund or a mix? Thank you. I'll continue to listen and learn. Look, I think if you are feeling comfortable with this, that's great. But let's be sure that your husband did not give the financial advisor a different mantra as to how he should be managing the money rather than the way you're managing it. In other words, are we sure that your husband said, you know, oh, I want this to be a conservative growth or I want this to be a 50-50, a balance? I mean, if your husband said, I want this to be very, very, very low risk and the, the results are that he got low risk, but also low return, then that's different. I don't want to throw the advisor under the bus because again, let's just double check and find out what did your husband actually say to this person. And maybe you you can do it. And maybe that's the greatest thing in the world. Okay. This last note, this is from Anonymous Anonymous, who's got a very big group of people who are his siblings and her siblings. Okay. Anonymous says, by the way, no one knows your situation. Uh, Anonymous lives uh, along the East Coast, is 54 years old, wife is 55. And he says, I'm going to have a small pension at the age of 65, about $7,000, no COLA. I guess he means a year. My wife will have one when she retires, 36000 with COLA. I like hers better. We will have to pay for health care, but we'll be able to stay on her estate plan. Good. We don't think anyone will rely on us financially in the future. We've got two girls uh, they're in the process of launching. We might need to help them. Okay, here's what they got. I can just look at these numbers very quickly and be like, they're fine. Okay, retirement savings. You ready, Mark? Uh, 1.3 million in a taxable brokerage account. 1.1 million in 401k IRAs, traditional. 600 Roth, 100,000 HSA. And very kindly, uh, Anonymous totals that up. 3.1 million. House paid off, no debts, cars paid off, no credit card debt, 200 grand in money in brokerage account, cash CDs. So here's the thing. We've been diligent savers and we have a big brokerage account because I invested in a company um, and the stock's taken off like a rocket. It's gone up so much over the last five years. I've sold some now. It's 8% of our total net worth. It's not so bad, 8%. He's got broadly diversified markets, 80 stocks, 10 bonds, 10 cash equivalents. We don't have a budget. I don't think you need it. I uh, don't have a great idea of what we spend a year. We spend more than we used to. <laughs> we still watch our expenses at the same time. All right. He, he thinks it's a hundred grand, 8,500 a month. Let's say it's 10 grand. Let's say it's 120 grand a month. Right. So look, he wants to spend 12,500. Okay. My wife is going to retire in four years. She'll have 30 years in her job. I'm burned out. I want to retire in less than a year. Wait a minute. He's only 54. Salaries are $73,000 each. How much do you feel we should put into our retirement accounts each year and in which type of account? Some years we've spent down our brokerage account to allow us to max out our 401ks and Roths. I know many couples with our net worth recommend to go all Roth, but 
aren't high earners with our large brokerage accounts, somewhat low marginal rate. We're in the middle, 22% marginal bracket. Okay. You can do whatever you want. You're fine. And, you know, over the next 10 years, what I would do if you're both going to be, she's going to retire when, let's just see when she's, he said, she's going to retire in four years. So why don't you get, why don't you stop doing, stop your whining. I'm totally kidding. You can stop. Why don't you pull some money out of your retirement account and live on that? And why don't you, in your first year that you're retired, figure out really what your spend is going to be? Because I don't think you're going from eight. I, I mean, you're really going to spend 50 grand a year to travel. I don't know. That seems like a lot to me. I think you should run the numbers at 10 grand a month from right now. And I think you're going to be fine. You have a lot of money. But I do think you should try to get some of that money out of that pre-tax account over the next 10 years, because that's going to be a really smart way for you to start to limit your liability in the future. The Jill on Money Show will be right back. K's, IRAs, refinancing, she covers it all. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. You're back. It's Jill on Money. Here's an email from Mark who wants to know about funding retirement and an inheritance. My wife and I are 60 years old. We both have retirement accounts. I have a thrift savings plan worth $925,000. My wife has $26,000 in her retirement account from her current employer. I plan to work a few more years, but she is considering retiring now. In May of 2023, she had to stop work to care for her mother, oh, who passed away in August, and she's not returned back to work. My wife is currently the personal representative of her mother's estate, we're in the process of transferring all of the assets, stocks, CDs, mutual funds, and retirement money into an estate account. The estate account will be used to pay for expenses associated with her mother's house, which we plan to renovate and sell next year. How can she best use the inheritance, which after the sale of the house should be about $500,000 to fund her retirement account, and if possible, avoid paying taxes on the money? My wife and I have a house that has a mortgage balance of $167,000 and $15,000 in credit card debt. Okay, let's take a breath here, Mark. So first and foremost, I'm so sorry about the situation. It's always weird talking about an inheritance because we have a person who actually passed away. So I'm sorry for the loss of your mother-in-law. Now, the next step of this process for your wife is that she's going to oversee the estate account. And, you know, eventually, as you said, the money will be distributed. And I presume there might be other siblings involved. But if you're telling me her share is $500,000, a couple of things to note. Number one, there probably is no estate tax that is due. There Maybe there's a state tax, a state death tax. I doubt it from the size of the estate. So you don't have to worry about any tax being um, passed to you in terms of estate tax. Now, that said, when the money goes into an estate account, when it's non-qualified or non-retirement money, what happens is that there can be an accumulation in that account. It can go up in value, and that can generate a tax liability for the estate. So I only point that out to you to, so that you know that the estate itself might have an income tax return to file. I presume you're working with an attorney and an accountant who can help you out with that. Now, once we get to the other end of this, um, a few things to remember. She will be inheriting partially a retirement account. And in that case, she has 10 years to get the money out. And that may be something that you think about doing after you, Mark, retire so that she takes the money and that income to her doesn't add to your own tax liability. Uh, of course, you should pay off the credit card debt, but don't pay off the mortgage balance. That doesn't seem necessary. Your wife can't put money into a retirement plan on her own uh, if she is no longer working, but maybe she can use a spousal retirement account. Or maybe because you don't have a lot of other money outside of retirement, maybe the best thing for her to do is to just put that in a brokerage account. 
Either way, I don't think she's going to go wrong. I do think that it's going to be a process. So please let us know if we can help you out. Here's an email from one of our favorites, Anonymous Anonymous. Oh, this is another show about inheritance. This is the show about inheritance, I guess. This one is, hey, Jill and Mark, I love listening to your show. I found you six months ago on YouTube, and I wish I found you sooner. Okay, Anonymous is asking for advice about an inheritance. Anonymous writes that my partner and I live in a low cost of living area. He is 40 years old. He makes $72,000 a year. I'm 39 and I make $101,000 a year. We are both eligible for pensions. If we stick in the system for 30 years, his annual pension should be around 44000 For me at 30 years, it would be 66000 Whew, that's a lot of money, man. Okay, we would be 55 and 53 at the 30-year point. Now, I may get a promotion in the next year, and that would lead to a pension of even more, 94000 for me, if that happens. We currently spend around $4,900 a month, which does not include retirement contributions, but it does include savings of $1,000 a month. Oh, my God, they're saving like crazy. They've got the pensions. What more can I ask for? In addition, they're putting $3,200 a month in savings. The current plan is to start transitioning that soon to paying down a home equity loan. Hmm, let's hear about the house. The house is worth around $480,000. There's no mortgage, but there is a home equity loan of $79,000 at 5.8%. Okay, I understand why you want to pay that down. My husband has $38,000 in a Roth uh, 457, 60,000 in a pre tax 401k, 6,500 in a Roth IRA. I have 93,000 in a pre tax 401k, 31 in a pre tax, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Husband recently inherited $55,000. They've got an eight year old, a six year old. They haven't saved a lot toward their college, about 10 grand between the two. Um, they've got a lot of programs in their area where they could potentially graduate with associate's degrees when they finish high school. This is the first time hearing about this in the last two weeks. These are amazing, these high schools where you graduate with a, an associate's degree. Anyway, she goes on to write, I'm not too worried about it. I don't think it's going to be hard for us to pay the remainder at that time. But what do we do with the inheritance? Should we pay down the home equity loan, put the money in 529s, invest, pay cash, blah, blah, blah. Also, they're also driving old cars. They may need to be replaced in the next one to three years. I don't like debt. My first inclination is to put a big chunk towards the home equity loan. Since it's 5.8%, I am kind of risk averse, but something you said about cash in a re recent episode really hit home, and I realize that we should be moving toward investing money soon. Okay. I'm happy to say we do have our estate planning documents done, and I look forward to hearing your advice about the inheritance and what we should do with the $3,200 a month that we are currently putting in our money market. Okay, so let's look at this. So they've got $30,000 in a money market account. They're putting money into retirement, but they still have $3,200 a month plus this fifty-five grand to pay that, that is a lump sum. So we know that they're going to need cars. I don't know how much they're going to spend on a car. I think that a car loan is probably pretty close to that 4 or 5%, but we'll see. You know, look, I think that the, the best thing that you can do is kind of split the difference. Why don't we say of the 55000 you already have 30000 that is in money market. You have pensions, and it sounds like your pensions are going to be pretty well set to fund what your needs are going to be in the future. I think we put 40000 down on the home equity line, and that gives you 15000 that is available plus the thirty. Keep putting money away until you finish with the car thing. And when the cars are done, then I think you're ready to start a different plan. The Jill on Money Show will be right back. Do I invest here? Should I put my money there? Jill Schlesinger can help you. Back to Jill on Money. You're back. It's the Jill on Money Show. I feel like this program has been going at a blistering pace. So let me take a deep breath here and tell you about some of the new stuff for the year ahead that we're so excited about. First of all, Mark and I love our job and we are 
always, always grateful that you listen every single weekend. But if you would like a little bit more of us, you can check out a lot of the stuff that we produce on other channels. So not other radio, but we've got podcasts and we have a brand new YouTube show. It's called Jill on Money Powered by the Compound. So we have links to that on our website at jillonmoney.com. Of course, that website has all sorts of great stuff. There's free stuff like the free weekly newsletter and the blog and resources. But if you have some extra money to spend, now's a wonderful time to be thinking about a great money reset. That's my book that was published earlier in 2023. And I feel like it is so perfect for this time of year, not just as a gift, but also as people are contemplating big changes in their lives. The Great Money Reset is available wherever you buy books or we have links on our website. You can also check out our subscription service called Jill on Money Live. That's where you have access to quarterly live webinars and some cool bonus content. Right now, let's get to an email from Joe. Um, And I love the message. Hello, Aunt Jill and Cousin Mark. My parents are from a crappy small town and will be moving to the big city. She's a recent heart transplant patient and they will need to relocate for her continued care. They want to sell their house in the small town and move to the big city. How should they think about funding this? They're old school. They're not interested in a loan. Okay, let's be clear about that. They don't want a loan. All right. They're going to have $280,000 from the sale of a house. They are going to have to purchase a home for $400,000. So we have a $120,000 delta there. They have living, ex- this is amazing. Their income basically covers their living expenses. 45 coming in, 45 going out. They're 69 and 72 years old. They've got a pre-tax 401k with a half a million dollars, and they've got cash from just cash. So I think what I would do is this. I think that if they really absolutely will not take on a loan, which I don't think I'd want to now with these rates anyway, they would take of their $180,000, they'd add that to the proceeds of the sale of the house, buy the new house and drain that cash account, and then start to little by little take some of the money out of that 401k to replenish some of their cash in case they need it. The question uh, is the bonus question, would it be worthwhile to pursue long-term care insurance she might, mom may need that. Mm, I don't think you have enough money to do that. Once you have the house, it's going to be too expensive. And I don't think she'll actually, I'm not sure she would qualify for it. So I wouldn't worry about it. Okay. Let's see. This is from, (laughs) this is funny. So this is from Elaine. Uh, Hi, Jill and Mark. I love the show. My partner, let's call him Jerry, like in Elaine and Jerry from Seinfeld. Okay. Partner of 12 years and I, they're thinking of getting married. His health insurance on the open market is just insane. We think it makes sense for taxes, but we need help in checking our math. We own a home together. We split the expenses 50-50. Jerry owns his own business with one full-time client. He makes about $150,000 a year. He pays himself 50. His business and personal tax filings are separate. He's 55 and healthy, but he likes to have good health insurance. Who doesn't? And on the open market, his costs are about, oh my gosh, about... Uh, Eight to nine fifty a month. Let's just call it a thousand dollars a month. He's got one point two million dollars in savings and retirement. I'm forty seven. I work a job, uh, W two, and I make four hundred fifty thousand dollars a year and about one point two million in savings and retirement. We are on track for early retirement. We keep our expenses at seven thousand dollars a month. We think we could have significant savings on our income taxes, filing married, and also put them on my health insurance for a hundred fifty dollars a month. How do I calculate our future tax bracket with his pay structure? He pays himself only 50. So do I use only that income plus my income? The health insurance alone would be a significant savings, but I've heard about the marriage tax if we do this wrong. So, okay, first of all, I bet he has an accountant who can help you with this. And um, I will tell you that that's a pretty easy thing at this time of year to ask an accountant to do. Hey, if we were to get married, how would this work? And I think... It's about right because you right now in the at four hundred fifty thousand dollars filing single, you're in a top bracket of thirty five percent. Now that's fine and dandy, all good because honestly, if you go into if you get married filing jointly, you would take your four fifty, add his fifty, which would put all that income at thirty five percent. 
But you can see from his point of view, he's going to be in a much higher tax bracket. His tax bracket goes from basically 12% to 35% on his 50 grand. I mean, look, it's not terrible. It's not that much money that he's making. The health insurance to me is a bigger deal, not so much about the cost, but that he has good coverage that he likes. At the end of the day, I don't think this is going to matter to you, either of you, in a meaningful way for your retirement. It's not going to mean anything in terms of your long-term sustainability. So if you want to get married, get married. And if it just bugs him so much to go out and shop on that marketplace and the coverage isn't as good as your coverage, then, uh, you know, go get married. It's okay. Um, But remember, all of his 50 grand will now be essentially taxed at the 35 percent bracket, whereas right now, oh, I I made a mistake. I said 12 percent. Right now, his 50 grand will be basically taxed at the 22 percent. So. You know, the marriage penalty is that his income is taxed at your highest rate. And if you don't mind it, then don't worry about it. It's the Jill on Money Show. We'll be right back. You're back. It's the Jill on Money program. And if you've got a financial question, we'd love to help you out. Just go to JillOnMoney.com and click the Contact Us button. Before we finish up, let's take an email. This is from Keith, who says, I always hear that while working, we should have six months emergency cash available in case of job losses and other unexpected things. What I never hear is a discussion about how much cash we should have readily available in retirement. You know, while we are merrily spending down our 401ks and 403bs on roofs and driveways and vacations, would you please address this topic for me? Absolutely, Keith. Happy to do so. I generally advise people who are still working to have at least six months of their expenses in an emergency reserve. But I've always also cautioned that depending on your life circumstances, even if you are working, maybe you want more, maybe you want a year of expenses. Maybe the kind of job that you have produces variable income. You know, you're commission-based just in case six months to a year is what I think. When it comes to retirement, I extend that period from one year to two years of expenses in an emergency reserve fund. Now, it is also possible that you use your retirement assets, that money that you are spending down in those pre-tax retirement accounts as part of a strategy. Not as a way to say, oh my gosh, it's the only money I have. But if you think that you have too much money in pre-tax accounts, then maybe it makes sense to use those things for driveways and vacations and roofs. But it should be part of an overall game plan that addresses how you're managing your tax liability in the future. I hope that helps. All right. If you have a financial question, all you need to do is go to our website, jillonmoney.com. That is where everything lives, all of our content, all the links to our other programs at jillonmoney.com. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Telercio is our executive producer and web king. Please do something nice for someone else today. Change your work, change your wealth, change your life. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll talk to you next week. <music> 